Welcome to our communion service here in the barn at Bambu. A special welcome to our visitors, to our neighbors, and to those online who are joining us from wherever you are in the world. We especially welcome Marcella Cree from Luxembourg, who will read the second reading and share her reflections with us. We also welcome Father Lawrence, who will meet with us at the Gospel and share his reflections. So welcome everyone. A few moments of silence as we prepare to begin our worship together. We begin our worship led by Vincent Bonelli, who will lead us with his music. Alone with none but thee, my God. I journeyed on my way What need I fear When thou art near O King of night and day In the morning Let me know your love O oh Lord In the morning let me know your love In the morning, in the morning Let me know your love Oh Lord In the morning Let me know your love Of you my heart has spoken Seek his face So I went out to the holy mountain I came back to that inner place In the morning Let me know your love Oh Lord In the morning Let me know your love In the morning, in the morning Let me know, know your love In the morning Let me know your love in the morning In the morning In the morning In the morning Let me know your love In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Kyrie, 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 
Let us pray. May your people exult forever, O God, in renewed youthfulness of spirit, so that rejoicing now in the restored glory of our adoption, we may look forward in confident hope to the rejoicing of the day of resurrection through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. We invite Jim Monaghan from Ireland to share the first reading with us. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. On the day of the Pentecost, Peter stood up with the eleven and address the crowd in a loud voice. Men of Israel, listen to what I'm going to say. Jesus of Nazarene was a man commended to you by God by the miracles and potents and signs that God worked through him when he was among you, as you all know. This man, who is put into your power by the deliberate intention and foreknowledge of God you took and had crucified by men outside the law. You killed him, but, raised, but God raised him to life, freeing him from the pangs of Hades, for it was impossible for him to be held in his power, since, as David says of him, I saw the Lord before me always, for with him at my right hand side nothing can shake me. So my heart was glad and my tongue cried out with joy, my body too, and rest in the hope that you will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor allow your Holy One to experience corruption. You have made the way you have made known the way of life to me. You have filled me with gladness through your presence. Brothers, no one can deny that the patriarch David himself is dead and buried. His tomb is here still with us. But since he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn him an oath to make one of his descendants and succeed him on the throne, what he foresaw and spoke about was the resurrection of Christ. He, was the, he is the one who was not abandoned to Hades and whose body did not experience corruption. God raised this man Jesus to life and, of all, and all of us are witness to that. Now raised to the heights by God's right hand he has received from the Father the Holy Spirit, who was promised, and what you see and hear is the outpouring of the Spirit. The Word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Thank you, John. <clears throat>
Yeah, the sun. Preserve me, God. I take refuge in you. I say to the Lord, you are my God. O oh Lord, it is you who are my portion and cup. It is you yourself who are my prize. I will bless the Lord who gives me counsel, who even at night directs my heart. I keep the Lord ever in my sight. Since he is at my right hand, I shall stand firm. And so my heart rejoices, my soul is glad. Even my body shall rest in safety. For you will not leave my soul among the dead, nor let your beloved know decay. You will show me the path of life, the fullness of joy in your presence. At your right hand, happiness forever. Thank you, I now invite Marcelo from Luxembourg to read the second reading and to share her reflections with us. Thank you, Marcelo, for joining us. Thank you, Stuart. A reading from the first letter of St. Peter. If you are acknowledging as your father, one who has no favorites and judges everyone according to what he has done, you must be scrupulously careful as long as you're living away from your home. Remember the ransom that was paid to free you from the useless way of life your ancestors handed down was not paid in anything corruptible neither in silver nor gold, but in the precious blood of a lamb without spot or stain, namely Christ, who, though known since before the world was made, has been revealed only in our time, the end of the ages, for your sake. Through him, you now have faith in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory for that very reason, so that you would have faith and hope in God. This is the word of the Lord. I know that I am living in exile from my true home. My home is with God. I know this longing for home in my life, in the more ordinary sense of it, either in boarding school, waiting for the weekends or holidays, or in other times when away from loved ones. I have experienced, like many of us, the longing to go home. But I also know this deeper longing for my ultimate home, even though for many years and decades, I suppressed it and refused to recognize it. As Peter says, you must be very careful when living away from your true home. This spark of longing that existed in me um, is something that St. Augustine speaks of. You have made us for yourself, Lord, and we can only find our rest when we, find, when we come to rest with you. I 
rediscovered this spark of longing through the skillful direction of a spiritual director. And finally and miraculously was led to meditation. Through meditation, I know that I can go home at any time. I can drop the anchor of the mantra and sink into the unified, conscious, unified consciousness and sit being with God, my heavenly father. Peter in this reading tries to set out for us what has been won for us. And what has been won, he uses the word, the ransom paid. Ransom was a word often used in the Hebrew Bible. But this ransom, this loving sacrifice that Jesus in his humanity made for us when he became the willing victim and suffered a horrific death on the cross, he won for us our freedom. We are, we have new life. There is for us no death, but new life and future. And this has been accomplished for us so that we might have faith in God. As Christians, our faith is an Easter faith. It's a faith based on the resurrection. The reading speaks about the useless way of life handed down to us, down to me from my ancestors. And whereas that might sound a little bit harsh on my ancestors, I think I understand what Peter was trying to say. I used to live a life where I thought faith was a useful sideline, something worth keeping on board for difficult times. So I know what he's referring to here. And through acknowledging this longing in me, through coming to faith, and to meditation, I'm able to put this at the center of my life. So I think I know what Peter is talking about here. We have new life based on the resurrection. We are an Easter people, and I thank God in Jesus Christ for that. Thank you, Marcella, for reminding us and leading us into deeper thought. We welcome the gospel now with the Alleluia. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Lord Jesus, explain the scriptures to us. Make our heart Hearts burn within us as you talk to us. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Two of the disciples of Jesus were on their way to a village called Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem. <clears throat> and they were talking together <clears throat> about all that had happened. Now, as they talked this over, Jesus himself 
came up and walked by their side, but something prevented them from recognizing him. He said to them, what matters are you discussing as you walk along? They stopped short, their faces downcast. Then one of them called Cleopas answered him, you must be the only one in person staying in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have been happening there these last few days. What things, he asked. All about Jesus of Nazareth, they answered, who proved he was a great prophet by the things he said and did in the sight of God and of the whole people, and how our chief priests and our leaders handed him over to be sentenced to death and had him crucified. Our own hope had been that he would be the one to set Israel free. And this is not all. Two whole days have gone by since it all happened, and some women from our group have astounded us. They went to the tomb in the early morning, and when they did not find the body, they came back to tell us that they had seen the vision of angels who declared he was alive. Some of our friends went to the tomb and found everything exactly as the women had reported, but of him they saw nothing. Then he said to them, you foolish men, so slow to understand, so slow to believe the full message of the prophets. Was it not ordained that the Christ should suffer and so enter into his glory? Then, starting with Moses and going through all the prophets, he explained to them the passages throughout the scriptures that were about himself. When they drew near to the village to which they were going, he made as if to go on, but they pressed him to stay with them. It is nearly evening, they said, and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. Now, while he was with them at table, he took the bread and said the blessing. Then he broke it and handed it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him. But he had vanished from their sight. Then they said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us as he talked to us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? They set out that instant and returned to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven assembled together with their companions, who said to them, Yes, it is true. The Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then they told their story of what had happened on the road and how they had recognized him at the breaking of bread. This is the Gospel of the Lord. really intimate conversation is possible probably only between two or three people. And as soon as you get into group dynamics, you have many other wonderful things happening, but uh, that intimacy, that directness uh, moves away. Jesus said, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. When we have retreats, we often conclude the retreat with what we call an Emmaus walk, where the people on the retreat uh, on the last day will, will join up with one other person, sometimes three if there's somebody uh, left out, and they will walk together, sharing what the experience of the retreat or that's meant for them. Reliving that moment of uh, intimacy and openness with Christ, forming a third or a fourth between us. Spiritual friendship 
in the Christian understanding is an intimate, trusting, personal relationship in which Christ is present in a real way, not in a dualistic way, but in a way that unites the two or the three into something fuller and richer and opens the encounter, the meeting, the union, the friendship, opens it up to the full reality of everything, to the reality of God. So I think this story of uh, the two disciples on the road to Emmaus has, has profound uh, meaning. It's a story about metanoia. We see at the end how the minds of the two disciples are completely opened and changed. And when the, their minds are opened after they've recognized uh, Jesus and the breaking of the bread, although it's nighttime, they at that instant leave and go back to Jerusalem to reconnect the, uh, with their community, with their friends, with the church. And this recognition then leads to reunion. And it fills them with energy. At the beginning of this story, their faces are downcast. They're, they've lost their hopes. They're disappointed in what has happened. They don't blame Jesus specifically, but they, they must be thinking, why did it all have to end like this? We had such great hopes. And now they are filled with a, with a wonder and an energy that simply transcends that sadness of loss and disappointment. What happens when we are disillusioned, when our hopes and fantasies are, are, are shattered, very hard to let go of them. So it's a wonderful story, and it's a funny story. It reminds me always of a pantomime in England, they have this rather sort of crude, uh, hum humorous thing at Christmas called pantomimes, where very stereotypical characters uh, play a sort of a fairy tale or uh, story. And uh, the children who are packing the theatres uh, with their parents uh, take part in the in the in the fun by shouting. Uh, to the characters on stage and saying, that's him, that's her. Uh, and because there's so much um, hidden identities or somebody's hiding behind a door and the kids are saying, he's there, he's there. So there is that humor. It can be also a tragic humor of misrecognition. And this story is about mistaken identity, meeting without recognizing, which is a sad and funny uh, mistake to be talking to somebody and then say, oh, yes, sorry, I recognize you now. I remember who you are. T.S. Eliot has a phrase that we had the experience but missed the meaning. We had the experience, but missed the meaning. And approach to the meaning restores the experience in a different form. We had the experience, but missed the meaning. But then approaching the meaning again restores the experience in a new form. And I think that is what this gospel story of the resurrection is also about. They had had the experience of Jesus. <clears throat> they had placed their hope and trust in him. Then that experience disappeared with his death and they were left with nothing. And Jesus then appro approaches them and helps them to see the meaning of what they had experienced, which they had not understood before. And he does this by opening the scriptures to them. And then the experience 
that they have lost is restored, but in a new form. And it comes at that moment of the breaking of the bread when their eyes were opened and they recognized him in his risen form. But then at that moment, he disappeared. But that didn't matter. It was the external form that disappeared. But something within them, which had begun even when he was explaining the meaning of the scriptures to them, because their hearts burned within them, but they didn't really understand that or understand the meaning of that experience, even, even of that awakening that had begun within them as he opened the scriptures to them. And, but now after he disappeared from their sight, he was within them. They didn't need the external form. And that was what was their metanoia. They turned around and went back to Jerusalem. So it's a, it's a story with so many different uh, levels and wonderful insights. And we'll only really understand it if we allow ourselves to be read by the story and to understand the ways in which we ourselves need to recognize Christ in the experience of, of life, even in the experience of loss and of disappointment or disillusionment. These, these, can, these are clearly opening of possibilities, new potential for us. Simon Weil said that he comes to us hidden and salvation consists in our recognizing him. Well, we have to sit in meditation letting go of the form that we are imagining. And therefore, we enter into a kind of poverty of spirit, which is a real poverty of spirit, because recognition happens when we are paying attention, but where we can also be surprised. And that means that we are paying attention, we're conscious, we're awake and we are animated by desire. We, we, but not a desire that we are fantasizing about. It's not a desire with images and preconceptions and demands. I want this in order to be happy. But it's a desire for what we do, even don't know what we desire. And that's meditation. It's pure desire. And that's what makes meditation pure practice attention animated by desire, and then that pure desire, which is sacramentalized in the saying of the mantra with deepening attention, that then makes us ready for this moment of recognition. And it's something that cannot be put into words, but it is the discovery that we are not isolated, separated, cut off, but that we are within this communion of the divine love and that that is expressed in all our human relationships with the intimate relationships of our lives with two, or three, and our relationships with each other, with strangers, with the whole of the human race. And that's why this interior recognition is the basis for the transformation of the world. And that's what inspired those early Christians to do something so completely crazy, which was to proclaim the risen Christ as we do in this Eucharist and in the breaking of the bread. The disciples recognized Jesus in the breaking of the bread. We pray that like the early Christians, we will have the faith to be aware of his divine presence when we worship together, but also in our own hearts, in the daily moments of our lives and in the people who journey with us. We pray like Peter in today's reading 
that we will be open to the outpouring of the Spirit as she reveals to us the truth about Christ, the truth about ourselves, and the truth about our way of life. We pray for our Muslim brothers and sisters who are celebrating Eid in these days. We pray for all those who promote peace in our world. We pray that we may be people of peace, bringing the hope of the resurrection into the lives of others. We pray for all our families and friends, for those who have died, for those who asked for our prayers in today's chat, for those in our Bonneville Book of Prayer, for Rosemary Norton and Susanna Eaton of the UK, for Michelle Massey and for Katie M and her infant in hospital in Maryland, for Irene Young from Singapore, and for Jacques Chanet, who died recently, and for his wife Anne-Marie, and for all who grieve the loss of loved ones. We pray in silence for our personal intentions. Heavenly Father, through the resurrection of your Son Jesus, who gave us light and new hope. We bring our prayers to you in the name of this same Jesus, your Son, our friend and Saviour. Amen. 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 As we prepare now to receive Christ in the Eucharist, we pray in our mother tongue in the words he gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and then forgive us our trespasses. Deliver us, Lord, we pray from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days. Keep us free from sin and from all distress as we await the coming of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. For the, For the kingdom, kingdom of our God, the glory of yours, now and forever. Let us offer one another the sign of peace. Peace, peace, peace. peace. Before we see the Lamb of God, when we distribute communion, we'll ask each one to hold the host until everybody has the host in their hand, and I'll make you a sign when we all receive together. So we have the Lamb of God now. Cordero de Dios. Que quitas el pecado del mundo, ten piedad de nosotros. Cordero de Dios, que quitas el pecado del mundo, ten piedad de nosotros. 
nosotros. Cordero de Dios, que quitas el pecado del mundo, danos la This is Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away our sins and those of the whole world. Happy are we to have such a friend as Jesus. Lord, I am not in your life, that you should enter under my roof, but to say the word and so May the body of Christ bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Amen.
Let us pray. Look with kindness upon your people, O Lord, and grant, we pray, that those you are pleased to renew by eternal mysteries may attain in their flesh the incorruptible glory of the resurrection through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Before our final blessing, I would like to thank all of you who joined us to worship online. To thank Leo and Anella and Simon for all the technical setting up. For all those who joined us, our neighbors, our friends. Marcella for her beautiful reflection. We thank Father Lawrence, even though we did not hear his reflection, but hopefully in the silence of our hearts, the Lord had a special message from that beautiful gospel for each of us. Thank all those who helped prepare for this day, Jim, Karen, MG, John. And before we do our final blessing, I asked Giovanni if he has any words of wisdom to share with us. So first a message from the tech room, thank you Ruth. And it says that the full uh, homily by Lawrence will be available on YouTube uh, soon. <laughs> How soon? Later today. Later today. Later today. There's always hope. So um, just a few announcements. <clears throat> Next week, I'm the speaker for the Metanoia series. I invite you to join me as I reflect on how our embodiment can be a support for metanoia, for changing our minds personally, and also for how we can change socially and structurally. So I'm excited, so come and see what, what comes out of that. Um, then uh, the week after, Sarah Bachelard will be joining us. She's a longtime friend of the community and a meditator. She's a wonderful contemporary theologian and author and the founder of a Benedictine community in Australia called Benedictus. And those are the things that she will be reflecting on on her retreat and her time here called Risking Delight. For those of you who are not joining us, uh, in person on the ground here at Bonvo. <clears throat> um, on Wednesday, the 3rd of May, in the evening, and you'll find the page now uh, uploaded to our website, she will be in conversation with us, and you can join us for this hybrid conversation between her and Lawrence. And uh, then from the 6th to the 11th of June, Andrew Harvey, well-known mystic, and author and also friend of the community will be leading a retreat here called Radical Regeneration, Christ Consciousness and Sacred Activism. And a major part of the retreat will be drawing on uh, the translation of poems that he made of Hadovich of Antwerp. The title of the book being Love is Everything, and Hadovich was an extraordinary mystic, and he shows us how she is a mystic for our time in her message of all, including love. Thank you. Thank you, Jenna. Mm -hmm. And now as we end our worship, let us raise our hands as we bless each other, <coughs> and we ask that the joy, the peace, the love and the hope of the resurrection will be with each of us, with our family and our friends, <coughs> as we bless each other in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We have our final music.
Let us go in peace and thanksgiving. Alleluia, alleluia. 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 Alleluia